The problem is when you go to each development house, each one is trying to bleed you of money as long as they possibly can. Imagine you're the CEO of Vitatech, positioned at the cutting edge of medical device manufacture. Very few people build their own manufacturing from scratch, unless maybe you're Elon Musk. Yeah, it is really hard. People, you know, aren't gonna trust you with the manufacturing process unless you've been doing it for 20 plus years. So we couldn't do anything large. We couldn't do anything, you know, small. You took a hard problem and you made it even harder. I was thinking in the back of my head, how much money would I need to put up of my own? Would I be able to get the money? The main thing with a medical device development space as it stands right now in the US is Jason, take me through um, your thinking on you want to, you know, you have this vision to make it much easier to sort of from, from sort of beginning to end, A to Z, soup the nuts, take medical devices and make it easier to get through the number of hurdles they have to go through. You experienced the challenges of this because you had been a longtime medical device salesman. You were good at that and you wanted to say, hey, I want to now make my own medical devices. So talk about the business opportunity, but also the challenge and why thinking in terms of a partnership was so critical um, for you as CEO. Thanks, Ben. Um, the The main thing with uh, the challenges with the medical device development space as it stands right now in the US is that you have a lot of subcategories. You have an R&D house, you have a regulatory house, you have a die mold and tooling house, you have a contract manufacturing house. Sometimes you have a sterile barrier packaging or a labeling house. Um, you have sterilization houses, and then you go on to a traditional medical device company that has distribution warehousing and a medical device sales team. The problem is, is that in the space right now, when you go to each development house, as just mentioned, each one is trying to bleed you of money as long as they possibly can to keep you um, uh, developing with them. For example, if if you were to uh, get a development and rapid prototyping done in a month, right, the development houses wouldn't be able to survive. So they want to develop your type of project for two or three years, sometimes four years, because the longer they have you, the better it is. Not saying that it can be done in one or two months, but it's the point is, is the you don't align on the same objectives. Same objectives being timelines, deliverables, uh, dollar amounts. So at each part in the phase of, of, of the development houses, you have a misalignment of objectives, deliverables, and dollars. And when medical devices, like what is a typical, what's a project you're working on now or, or something you sold, like just to give people something concrete, like what kind of device are we talking about? Any medical device that you can do a, a bunch of different subclassifications of medical devices, whether it be, you know, uh, mechanicals, whether it be um, electrical, whether it be software related, um, if you want to throw in robots in there, right, or you want to start throwing in biologics. So there's all different types of medical devices. If you want to go to actual medical devices that we do, we do medical devices that have, you know, 20 to 30 some components to it that are a highly uh, uh, put together assembled uh, product. For example, um, energy devices, laparoscopic energy devices, uh, laparoscopes, um, ultrasound machines, um, arthrectomy devices, thrombectomy devices, um, devices that have a lot of inter intricacies to it. So th there's these devices, they're intricacies, and because they're medical, you can't just, you know, slap them together and say, we're done, let's go sell it. No, there's a, there's a deliberate process involved in this. And, and you experienced the, the, the challenge of this from a couple different perspectives. I mean, one, you just, you know, you, you were a salesman, you wanted you thought, let's make some devices and you had difficulty for all the reasons you mentioned getting them made. But then two, it sort of strikes me as you took a hard problem and you made it even harder because instead of just saying, I want to just make a device, you said, now I want to like build a company that makes devices. So I want to do this like multiple times at once. And now, right, you were looking for partners to help you be a partner in making in a company that makes devices, not just making a single device. Is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah. So what we, you're spot on, Ben. So, I mean, it got to the point where we said to ourselves, okay, well, we're really good at doing this, of bringing a medical device to market in two years. So let's copy and paste that and provide that solution to someone else um, so that they don't have to go through all the challenges, right? There's a lot of challenges that go through uh, the development process. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so your big challenge then was you were trying to find like, okay, who is the partner who you felt like, you know, you needed like physical manufacturing, right? You need someone who could do manufacturing, you need someone who could do compliance, but then uh, what was your process? Like you were trying to go out to just, were, were you cold calling people, others saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a partner in this. What, what were you doing? Were you, was there anywhere in the US where you looking in your backyard? How, how, what was your search like for the partner to execute this business vision? Um, and, 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 would, and, and I don't even know if you would have gone on with the, the business if you hadn't found the partner. So the, the challenge was is finding someone that was in Minnesota, finding someone that wanted to sell their business, finding someone that had uh, dye mold and tooling. Uh, that was a huge, huge component. And then um, there's a very specific uh, problem that occurs right now in, in manufacturing. Most of the times, the medical device company is not allowed on the manufacturing floor. Why is that? It's because there's a lot of problems, right, with potentially having that, meaning that um, they can come in there and take a lot of resources and time of trying to fix their manufacturing problems. Um, perhaps the, the medical device manufacturer is working on other projects, right, and they're not getting to that medical device project as quick as they would like. They don't have personnel or what have you. Um, so finding that medical device manufacturer that uh, had that unique capability where engineers from medical device companies can literally be on site and walk the production floor. And as they walk the production floor, what's unique about that is that if there's any uh, last minute fire drills, if there's any um, overtime or overnight um, uh, needs that need to be done, that on-site engineer from the medical device company can be there to do those type of, of tasks at hand. I'm trying to get a sense of how, how much of this is a needle in a haystack you're looking for. I mean, you're talking about Minnesota, so you're, you're not, you know, you're focused on one area. That's where, that's where you are. You're located near the twin, yeah, near, near the twin cities. You, you need sort of the die cut manufacturing and you need some type of flexibility because some of your value add, as you describe it, is, you know, having engineers being able to have you know, direct visibility, transparency in manufacturing, because that can save a lot of problems, issues. You can make different decisions if they know. So you need someone who's set up to allow that. How, how many just flat out companies that even in this space are there in, in, in Minnesota? What's your universe to sort of eventually find, you know, the partner? Yeah, here in Minnesota, let's just say we um, have a hundred uh, contract manufacturers in the medical device space. Okay, hundred contract manufacturers, and and what did you do? So you're you're going, you're like, I, you know, I, I know there's one out there, I know there's five out there, I there's going to be twenty. I, what what was your thought process, or like, or, you know, uh, you know, please God, let there be one. Like, what was it? Uh, yeah, I would say it's it's the it was the latter. It was like, please God, let there be one, um, because it 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 honestly doesn't exist. And so I was going through everyone, and the, you have to you have to think about it too. There's a lot of uh, contract manufacturers out of the hundred that just don't aren't wanting to sell their company. They want nothing to do with it. They're fine with what they're doing. Did it have to be a, a sale of the company for it to work for you? It couldn't have been a partnership or a 50-50. No, you wanted you were looking to acquire a company. Correct, hundred percent. I was going around the Twin Cities. I was literally cold calling people. I was finding people on LinkedIn. And you, you were doing this your, your, yourself. Me and my partner were just going one by one um, through. Uh, luckily, uh, Rich Thompson has a ton of experience in the space. He's been doing medical devices for 23 plus years. And so he knew a lot of the people to go, you know, to go after. Um, but however, it's, you know, you, you really want to look at everyone, right? You want to give everyone a fair shake. You want to see what, the, if anyone has done anything differently lately. What was the financial parameters here? You, you had raised funds or you, or you had self-funded to be able to acquire a company if you could, if you could find it or, or how, how, what about that piece of it? Did you have a certain range you had to stay within? You couldn't be too big, uh, too small. Like how, how did the finances work? 
Yeah, it's self-funded. So we couldn't, it was uh, mainly from myself. So we couldn't do anything large. We couldn't do anything, you know, small. A lot of ours things had to be um, on a earn out on a, on a future basis. So it had to be attractive from the owner that they were excited with what we're doing. I see, because you weren't going to just like write them a check and cash them out the minute you take the keys. It was going to be an earn out. So, so you actually have three levels of things here. One, you need to find the company that exists, that hopefully it exists. Two, you need a company that wants to sell. And then three, you need a company that wants to sell on terms that are somewhat, you know, favorable and, and future looking that is not just someone who wants to go to their Caribbean island right now and just give me the check and I'm off. Yeah. It is really hard. I mean, you can, uh, you can, you, you're spot on. The other thing, th there was a fourth option there, but I really didn't want to do it. The fourth option was I could hire a couple of people and try and do it myself. Okay. So you, you mean you were going to hire people who had experience from these places? And what were you trying to do? Set up your own manufacturing operation? Yeah. A hundred percent is to the, the, the thought process, the machinery, right? The overhead already. Um, we wanted a base of business of, of uh, current medical devices that we are already manufacturing because that can offset a lot of other things that we were doing. So there's just so many things that go in. to try and do it ourselves and stand it up on our on our own. Um, you don't have the experience. People, you know, aren't going to trust you with the manufacturing process unless you've been doing it for 20 plus years. Right. Very few people build their own manufacturing from scratch, unless maybe you're Elon Musk or something like that, you, you attempt it, right? But it's, it's, it's difficult to do. And, and so take us, how long was the time, the, the sort of the search for the partner? Was this over what period of time are you searching? About two years. About two years you were, you were searching. And at any point during that time, did you, did you think of, you know, maybe we ought to just build this ourselves? Every single time, as I was interviewing every single person, I was thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, well, if I tried to do exactly what they're doing right now, how much money would I need to uh, put up of my own? Would I be able to get the money? How many people would I have to hire? Because there's subspecialties in the manufacturing process, right? And so you'd have to hire every single one of these people, plus let alone the equipment, getting the equipment set up and operational. Um, and then having that extra flow of revenue, right? The extra flow of revenue is huge. And if you don't have that, how can you stand up a manufacturing? I see. And you mean the extra flow of revenue from your existing projects that you could use that could kind of fund other things. And, and, and where did that revenue come from? That was from your existing business you had, which was sort of being a partner on um, maybe earlier parts of the sort of the, the stream of the development process, you already had that. So you knew you could kind of plug them into the manufacturing piece that would fund some of this. Is that right? Yeah. So we have, um, our business is unique because we have the R and D side, we have, um, regulatory, and then we have our own medical device products. So we have nine medical device products. So, uh, we're selling two of them in the marketplace right now. So we have revenue from, uh, three different business units, if you will. Um, so is the point of saying, hey, perhaps I can use that revenue to stand up my own manufacturing facility. The, the fact of the matter is, is it, it just the barrier to entry is extreme. And what type of revenue um, at, before we get to present day, but like kind of like back then when you were like deciding all, all, all of this and trying to figure out the partner, like like what kind of like sort of dollars are we talking about, like revenue wise and, and, and people, what kind of operation were you and what, what kind of, you were trying to become something bigger? Yeah, we're, we were sub three mil in rev. Um, we were, it, it wasn't much at all. Um, you know, last year combined efforts, um, we were 10 M in rev on four M and EBITDA. So we've grown significantly. 3 million in revenue. Um, you know, obviously you have, you have cost against that, that too. And how could you use that I guess maybe challenging to be like to build something from scratch and to have, have, you know, off of that. And of course you'd be staking all of it against it. Right. Which would, which would be difficult as well. Yeah. And so it just wasn't going to, it didn't make sense. Right. It just wasn't going to happen. What was the aha moment? Like when did you realize that there's this company out there called iTech and this company is not in the far slung um, corners of, uh, the great state of Minnesota, uh, but is actually, um, 
uh, you know, uh, maybe you could, you could go have a coffee cause they're, they're down the road five minutes. When, when, when did that re- realization occur? Yeah. So I remember I was out to lunch with this, uh, contract manufacturer and I was discussing, you know, we had sat down a number of the different times, but I was, I was, uh, I was like, Hey, you know, tell me about, um, what it looks like for you in the next five years. And the gentleman was, uh, um, Pat was like, you know what? I, I don't want to be working in five years. I want to be, I want to sell my business in five years. And I was like, yeah, you, you put down your cup of coffee. You, you put down your, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. You're like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, Pat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, Hey, just, you know, crazy idea here. What if, what if we just bought you? And he's like, yeah, that, that's works great. But how about this? He's like, I, I actually want to keep on working. And I was like, well, that works out. Well, why don't we, why don't we work something out where we have our earn out over time and, you know, we combine forces, you know, one plus one is greater than, you know, two, right. It's, it's three, four, five, and let's, uh, let's work something out so we can, um, you know, you, you, so on the contract manufacturing side, what was, what's always super interesting is that you have a very low margin. Okay. If you have, you have 15 to 20% margin. So that's, you're, you're always trying to look to the next month, the next quarter, and you're, you're working on slim, some margins. If you have someone that leaves you, um, you end up, you know, getting hurt, right? You have to lay off people. Is you meaning losing a, a client or something unexpected pulls out because you're kind of going quarter to quarter, year to year? Yeah, hundred percent. And so, you know, it, w- for us, we had very high margins on our regulatory, um, our sterilization, on our own medical device products, right? And then um, the R and D side, we were purely just trying to get clients through the door. So you you get to this really awesome marriage, Pat, of saying, "Hey, we sh- we can do this all together. You don't have to worry about clients leaving you anymore. Um, we have our own medical devices that you can manufacture. They're never going to leave." And oh, by the way, we're, I'm your perfect retirement option now of saying, hey, um, let's, let's join forces together and then I will buy you out over time. And, and uh, Pat was 100% agreeable to it. And that's where we got to where we're at today. Okay, so, so it took you two years to sort of find Pat. And then how long did the, what was the actual contractual process like? How complex was it to do that kind of, and for people listening who are CEOs, it doesn't, haven't done, you know, this type of kind of maybe partnership with unique buyout process and, you know, retirement, but not yet. And and how, how complicated was that to negotiate? Very complicated because, you know, from a typical just business owner, the business, you know, um, you know, I, I think I, I come from a younger generation. He comes from an older generation. Has this been his baby? Was he the, was he the founder of this? And how, how many years has he worked in this business? Has he worked in this business? 20 plus years. This is his child. He's, he's raised this child. And even if you want to retire, you, you know, well, you know, you want to see your child treated well, right. And, and respected for what you've done right too. So, so yeah. So what was that process like? Yeah, so the the process went over about a six month um, process where we had to agree on a, a top line earnout and a bottom line based on performance, based on like what the what the price is going to be. You guys kill it; it's going to be here, but it's not less than here if things don't quite work out as as planned. Exactly, and so we had to go. You know, there's you can make a deal as as crazy articulate as you want it to be, or you can make it as simple as you want it to be. Right? That's so. What we tried to stick to was as simple of terms as we possibly could be. Every single time we we tried to keep it to to five different uh, terms. Right? Every time we tried to add in more and more things, and we were trying to make it, you know get it more and more complicated we said to ourselves and it was a great is a great talk, learning moment for both of us is the fact of the matter is we kept on saying okay well we could make it more complicated we could put in 20 different uh variables both sides at this point are saying let's keep it simple so both sides had a goal of simplicity here 
let's keep it simple. So we'd always we'd always be to the point where we're like, oh, let's let's add in more and more variables, and then we would dial it back and say, no, 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 let's keep it to five. Let's keep it as simple as possible because the more complicated we do it, we're just it's not going to work. So um, we've dialed it back to there's a there's a top line, there's a bottom line. Um, there was an agreed upon percentage on the merger. There is agreed upon per, uh, percentage once the buyout happened, and then uh, you know the sharing of expenses and costs, right? And so we we tried to agree on just those five five simple things, and try not to add in of saying, oh well, you know, for crazy terms, a uh, medical device project comes in and it's going to use X and Y and Z, and maybe it's going to have this equity, or you know, you you can make it as crazy complicated as you wanted to be. We just decided not to do that. Was there any point during this negotiation where you were worried it would fall through? All the time. <laughs> All the time. Now, is that just you being Jason? Are you just a, are you just a, are you just a warrior, Jason? You can you can come come clean on top CEO. Are you just a warrior, or or no? You had reason to be because it was precarious and from one day to the next. Even also, it can be emotional. Some people may choose like you know what? I do not want to sell my baby. I could just flat out. I've decided I'm not. I don't want to do it. So so was that. Found good founded or, or unfounded reasons for worrying? Um, you know, there there is uh, various things that you know would happen either from my employees or his employees or from me or him that would constantly uh, come up over the past year. Right? Um, it, it, nothing is is perfect by any means. Uh, we're not kidding ourselves here, right? Um, there was. I mean, yeah, I could tell you about something on a manufacturing equipment being wrecked, right? It was wrecked. Who pays for it, right? The first person <laughs> to say, hey, it's not me. No, it's you. It's your manufacturing. No, but it's, you know what I mean? So it, it gets to this, like, um, you know, some things you have to take on the chin and you just have to, um, you want it to work, right? I, I think it's like one of those perfect marriages where you get into a marriage, you don't find reasons not to work with each other, right? So it sounds like there's actually two pieces. One is during the negotiation itself, just the back and forth of six months, Did you were you worried that, it, that people did that at some point we just walk away, yeah, we're too far apart, you don't value what I've built, stuff like that? Or, or no, was it you felt like you both sides were committed to getting it done? It was just a matter of time. Yeah, I think it was the latter. We're both committed to getting it done. We both had something that the other wanted, right? The contract manufacturing was stuck to their very low margins. They're stuck to their current client base, and um, they didn't have a way out. On the on our side, we had new growth. We had our own medical devices. We had our own uh, regulatory. Um, we were pulling in new clients that we could then pass on to contract manufacturing. But you didn't have the, the sort of the plumbing, the infrastructure to do. Okay, so that was there. And then and then the actual earn out, buy, it's, a, it's a five-year period. Is that right? Yeah, so we have we have a, 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 a five-year um, earn out buyout. But wh wh where are you in the, in, in the, in the, in the duration now? Um, this, this is our second year of being within our merger. So from his, from his end, he's really, really excited because he sees the light at the end of the tunnel that his baby is going to be passed off in a nice manner and he will have his, his burnout, right? Which is not a lot of contract manufacturers in the U S have that opportunity of having a sizable dollar amount earnout. It doesn't exist. I see. Meaning it's not a type of business that is easy to necessarily pass on or sell or something like that. It's, 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 it's one that you earn from operating. Correct. Yeah. Cause you, you think about it from the CM perspective, 
um, from all these small business owners. I mean, they're not trying to grow or to do, you know, 5 million, 10 million, 10 million, 20 million, right, in a year. They're just trying to have a business where they can support their employees, right, and support the, the people in their community. And they're happy just surviving, right? That's what they're happy doing. Sure. And, and so as you go through this process now, what were some, I mean, I think you alluded to, to a bit of it, but like, what were some of the challenges that just come from like, working together, different employees, different cultures, different equipment. What, what were some of the challenges, the new set of challenges you just have to have to overcome that involves two different companies? Yeah, the challenges, as you can imagine, from a contract manufacturing side, just talk about the culture, right? The culture is a totally different world. It, did it match the founders? Are the company's reflections of the founders? I mean, old school, bit newer school. You got the, Jason, people are just listening. Hey, we'll share some of this on, on our YouTube channel, but you know, you got, you got to kind of got the trendy, like the, I think the, the, the sort of, I don't know if they call it a faux hawk these days or a fade haircut. You look, you know, you're a put together a uh, guy. I would call you new school. I don't know if you'd call it. sounds like you've been in a career while a little bit older school. Is that correct? I don't know if the companies parallel this as well. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. So I would say that we're more new school over here and, um, and the uh, manufacturing and die mold and tooling is is old school. Um, however, the, it's different cultures completely. Right. The culture over here is is we're trying to innovate and come out with new things as quickly as possible. We're in the trenches. We're in the ground level of medical device. We're in the OR. So we're you know we're very much involved on the manufacturing side. It's purely manufacturing products, right? And then all the regulatory aspects that go along with that. So you can kind of see it's it's a, just a totally different style. the biggest challenges for, for you now in, in the next, you know, from year two to year five, I mean, what are the things that would, would block your success? What are the things you're going to have to learn how to over, overcome? What still is out there? Yeah. My challenges on a day-to-day -day basis right now are driving each one of the business units um, as our medical devices hit each development process within our company. So as things get stuck, if you will, in, in, regulatory or if they get stuck in ETO sterilization, my job is to dig in on why they're getting stuck and then obviously come up with an action plan. The other thing is, is from a culture perspective, it's going to be a um, culture shock, if you will, <laughs> from the manufacturing facility uh, because you can, you, you know, it's a, it's a new space, uh, new people, new processes. How many people are we talking about between the, the, you know, basically like, like the original sort of your company and then iTech, how, how many people is that involved? We have 55 employees. Um, I'm about to send off another offer letter. Um, so we'll have 56. Combined. Got it. And do you, uh, for bridging the cultural gap, I mean, is there, uh, you know, do you expect everyone to, 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 to come along board? Do you have some people that, that will resist? Do you have some people who, you know, when someone, when someone has a business for a long time, uh, you know, maybe very loyal to Pat and, you know, Hey, uh, but Pat wouldn't have done it like that, Jason, you know, this is how Pat would do it. You know, do, do you ever, do you think about things like that? A hundred percent. And that's why I think it's so important to have um, Pat on board for a period of time and that we have a really good transition plan. I do 100% believe that people will leave just for whatever reason, right? Either a location perspective or a culture perspective, um, just might not, you know, might not be a good fit anymore. I do think that that the culture, how do we, how do we implement that? I think the best way that I implement myself into a culture of the company, I don't know if you can tell right here, Ben, this is my office is right out in the open of the entire office floor. Um, I, anyone can walk through and talk to me. Anyone can, you know, 
Uh, I'm not in a closed door. Nothing in here is closed door. We have glass for offices. Um, so it's completely transparent of what's being worked on, what's being done. We, you know, all the boards are white whiteboarded so people can have ideas and be talking about ideas constantly. Um, so what does that look like for the old school folks? I think as they come over, it's super important that, again, I, I go over there uh, pretty consistently. I try and be over there two or three times a week. Um, I'm trying to walk around. I'm trying to talk to everyone. I'm trying to, you know, get to know everyone as much as I possibly can. Uh, you know, tell people what's important. There's certain things that are very, very important that need to be, you know, um, uh, uh, up on top of their objective list. But at the same time, um, we're hiring new people to, uh, you know, from my perspective, we're hiring new people to be at iTech and then they're also over here. So they're spending time at both the new facility here and the manufacturing facility so they we can start having that integration of culture. The other thing that we do, I mean, we did a huge canoe trip. Um, we went to do, <laughs> so that was super fun with uh, both uh, groups. Um, we try and do outings as much as we possibly can. We were going to do a tubing outing, but there's no snow here in Minnesota for some reason. So, you know, people don't like doing that sometimes, you know, people like to, um, be by themselves and they don't want to be in, in part of the culture, but, um, we're trying to do as much as we possibly can to involve people in the culture. The other thing that's completely different, we do, um, equity stock options for every single employee that we have here. So everyone has an equity stake within the company, which does not happen at other manufacturing or R&D companies at all, right? It's very, very rare. So we feel like, hey, we, we protect the equity like it's gold, like it's our family. And so by giving a piece of that gold, a piece of our family to other employees, right? Other uh, that we're, we're hoping that we can share in the success together, right? We're not, it's not just an employee, you know, fee for service. Sure. Well, and, and, and do you feel like, um, you know, to wrap up, you know, how will you need to grow as a CEO to, to realize the full potential of this next three year period? Are there skills you don't have? Are there, uh, things you're working on? What will have to change just for, for you as a CEO? Yeah, I think, you know, getting it into, um, this isn't, it's not like I've done it before. So this is all brand new to me. So a hundred percent, I will, I will have to grow. I have to grow from what I was doing. You know, I have a vision of how I want it to happen. Um, but there's a lot that goes into, you know, for instance, I don't have a finance background. I don't have any type of an accountant background, um, to grow and to do bigger things as a company. We need to have, um, audited financials. We need to have, you know, there's metrics in place that need to be in place to make sure that the company grows. It's just skill sets that I do not have. And I've never been privy to before. I've never been in the position to, um, so I'm very, uh, I realize my, my shortcomings for sure. However, um, you know, we have, we have some major growth that's going to happen within the next couple of years. Well, and, and, and final question for you is, um, is what is your advice for other CEOs that feel like to unlock a new business model, they need that perfect partner, right? That they, they have a vision for something, but it's not something that they fully control on their own that they can implement. They have to find someone else to help them do it. Sometimes that could be an early stage startup that just needs like, oh, we don't have this technical expertise. I need this to be able to do this. Or it could be much later stage where, where you know, uh, we just this complementary capabilities or access to markets. It could be someone else where it's like, oh, I see what this could be, but I just need someone else and it's hard to find them. Uh, just like maybe how we connected too, I, I think I feel like the CEOs nowadays need to be networking nonstop, right? Because you never know who you're going to run into or, um, you know, who can help you in whatever phase that you're in growth with your company. So I spend, uh, I try and spend a different amount of chunks of time in a week dedicated to certain things, right? I try and spend a certain amount of time, uh, chunks of my time to networking. I try and spend certain amount of chunks of my time with my culture of my people, right? 
uh, chunks of my time, there's a business unit that is failing in some way, shape, or form, and I need to have action items to move that forward, right? There's new business that's coming in that you need to um, move in a certain direction. Um, so I do feel like that is, you know, uh, for new CEOs out there, number one, it can be done. There are people out there that can help you in some way, shape, or form. I think just networking is a huge set. It's a huge, um, it's a huge must. With 56 souls steering the ship, Jason's task is monumental. A symphony of innovation and unity that seeks to harmonize the discordant melodies of the old and new. The journey forward is a tightrope walk over the chasm of change. A testament to the resilience and foresight required to navigate the future's uncertain waters. In this crucible of creation, cultures will collide and blend, forging a new alloy stronger and more vibrant than its components. Vitatech stands ready, not just to face the coming storms, but to harness them. Driving Vitatech towards a destiny where each team member not only shares in the labor, but also the glory of their collective endeavor. And so, as we close this chapter of Vitatech's Odyssey, we do so with eyes wide open, hearts buoyed by the spirit of collaboration and spirits lifted by the promise of innovation. The path may be fraught with trials, but the will to overcome them is indomitable. And with that, it's case closed. <laughs>